afternoon. Welcome to Glaucoma and Your Emotional Well-Being. My name is Michelle Delisalde, and I am the Event Program Manager at Glaucoma Research Foundation. I'd like to take a moment and thank Airy Pharmaceuticals for their sponsorship of our webinar series and their continued support of glaucoma patients everywhere. As you well know, glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness. So now in January during Glaucoma Awareness Month, it's really important to raise awareness about the importance of regular eye examinations to preserve your vision. So take advantage of this month and talk to your family and friends about glaucoma. Today, we have the pleasure of having Allison Fine. She's a clinical social worker based in Seattle. She has a master of social work um, from the University of Kansas, and she's been a licensed independent clinical social worker in Washington state since 2012. Allison serves as the founder and executive director for the Center of Chronic Illness as well, and she's worked as a private practice therapist for the past 13 years. Dr. Samuel Solish graduated from Tufts University Medical School and completed his residency with the New England Medical Center. Samuel Solish is a glaucoma and cataract specialist with Eye Care Medical Group in Portland and has over 37 years of experience. After these two presentations, we'll have a Q&A where we'll be able to answer all of your questions. And we'll be also joined by two glaucoma patients, Patricia Caulfield and Tracy Hammond. It is my honor to welcome Allison, who will speak first, followed by Dr. Solish. Thank you so much for that introduction, Michelle, and thank you to the Glaucoma Research Foundation for inviting me to join all of you today. Uh, so I want to chat a little bit about glaucoma and your emotional well-being. And I know we don't have a lot of time today for me to cover all that is encompassed in that topic. Um, and so, you know, keep in mind that some of these topics that I'm going to be introducing uh, will just barely be scratching the surface in a lot of ways. So I'm going to jump right in. So uh, my presentation today is kind of twofold. So the first portion, we're going to be talking about some of the emotional challenges of living with and also being impacted by glaucoma. And then for the second portion, we're going to talk a little bit about coping strategies and self-care for managing uh, the whole variety of emotions of living with glaucoma. So I wanted to just introduce this idea of emotions to start off. So why emotions? You know, we all experience this. It's really a normal, healthy part of the human experience. Uh, at times, it might feel disruptive when we feel different emotions in our lives, or it might not come at the right time, um, but they really are, are something that cannot be avoided. It's just part of how we're wired as human beings and part of our brain's job. You know, each organ in our body has a job, and part of the brain's job is to feel um, and to create emotions. Uh, so I want to just introduce this idea of grief and loss. So I think oftentimes when we think of grief and loss, we think of the loss of a loved one. So I think most of us have probably dealt with the loss of a loved one of some kind at some point in our lives. Uh, but the emotional experience of losing a loved one is really actually very similar to going through other types of losses. So it might be loss of functioning, um, loss of vision in the case of glaucoma, potentially uh, loss of a relationship, loss of a job, uh, loss of a career, maybe loss of what uh, one anticipated that their life was going to be like at a certain point in time. Um, and I think one of the things to know about loss is that it can be, you know, something that's happening in the present moment. So you experience a loss and then you go through a lot of emotions related to that loss, or it might be anticipatory. So if you're anticipating losing your vision, for example, you might be experiencing some of those emotions leading up to that loss itself. Um, and sometimes if we're going through multiple losses at a time, that can really become what we call complex grief. So if you've lost a loved one right around the time that you received a glaucoma diagnosis, you might have uh, different emotions related with both losses that might feel conflicting at times, and that can um, be described as complex uh, grief and loss. I mean, you notice some emotions described at the bottom there um, that really um, are pretty key to the grief and loss process. Uh, but what I'll say about that is that you often hear like the stages of grief talked about in regards to grief and loss. 
And the stages, you know, don't happen in any particular order. And it really depends on how you've dealt with different losses in the past, how many losses you might have experienced in the past, and how you face different kinds of adversity in your life um, will help dictate how you deal with a new loss. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about depression. So I think when we think about depression, we typically think about the sadness, but there are a lot of other, uh, you know, symptoms and experiences that can also be um, looked at when we think about depression. Um, some of those that I like to point out are the anger and irritability. Um, also things like appetite or sleep changes, either we're eating too much or we're not eating enough, sleeping too much, not sleeping enough, uh, waking up in the middle of the night. Um, negative thinking patterns, I think, are really core to depression for a lot of people. Um, so really, you know, when we're looking at depression, you know, in glaucoma in particular, there have really been inconsistent studies. So as I was um, looking into this for this particular presentation, you know, I realized that depending on what country the study was done in, and then also, um, you know, levels of depression for, you know, that population in general, it appeared that, for example, in, in China studies that they've done, they found high levels of depression and anxiety in the glaucoma patients and drew the conclusion that that was the cause versus some other countries where depression rates and anxiety rates weren't quite as high. Um, so something to think and uh, to keep in mind, and also if you notice yourself experiencing symptoms of depression, uh, no matter how extreme, you know, depression can can fall in a continuum. Um, but no matter how extreme, I think it's important to talk to your doctor about that and figure out, is there something that you should do about that? Uh, so anxiety. So, you know, we all experience different fears and worries at different points in our life. And some of us are more predisposed to have more anxiety than others. Um, you know, at the top there, you'll see some of the kind of hallmarks of anxiety um, at its more extreme version. Some people might experience anxiety attacks or what we call panic attacks. Um, but in regards to glaucoma, there's really a, a huge fear of vision loss and a fear of the unknown that um, that researchers have looked at. Um, and sometimes it's a fear about what's happening in the present moment. And then sometimes it's worry over what has happened in the past or, or what's to come in the future. Um, and sometimes the worries can be associated with the vision loss itself or the diagnosis itself. Um, for some people, there's a fear of medical systems, medical care, so that can definitely play into it. And then for other people, sometimes it's more about uh, what are the things that are impacted in your life as a result of the diagnosis. And so, for example, you know, medical bills, uh, financial worries, maybe social anxiety, depending on how your social circle, or your family deals with illness or has dealt with illness in the past, that might create some anxiety around spending time with those same people again. Um, and then I just wanted to mention some other common emotions. You know, these are, again, part of just being human in general, but I think in regards to a glaucoma diagnosis, these are things that can come up. Um, so shame and embarrassment, again, depending on how glaucoma, or I'm sorry, how um, illness is kind of seen in your family or in your social circles, um, there can be some shame or embarrassment. There can be kind of self-blame as well, the sense of, I brought this on myself, even though it's the diagnosis is not something that you can control or that you asked for. Um, there might be feelings of guilt. So, you know, if you're not able to engage in your life in the same way that you were before, maybe you can't do things around the house as you used to, maybe family members have to help out a little bit more, there might be some guilt associated with that. Um, and then finally, you know, just like, you know, all humans, we experience happy emotions as well. So just because you're living with glaucoma doesn't mean that you can't also experience hope, joy, contentment, um, and the others listed there as well as many, many others. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about stress. So stress is something that, again, we all have experienced at different times in our life, and there are different things that can lead to you know, more stress, such as being diagnosed with um, glaucoma or another type of chronic health condition. Um, so the thing to know is that 75% of doctor's visits are a result of stress in this country. And so, you know, thinking about when you do go to the doctor, you know, are there things in your life that are creating extra stress or is it the, the diagnosis itself maybe or some other health challenge that you're facing? Or could it be some of these other things we're talking about like depression or anxiety? 
Um, and things like chronic stress, so ongoing chronic stress can lead to things like depression and anxiety. And so it's important to keep an eye on that as well. And if you notice that you've been stressed out for a long time, you know, might be a good time to think about getting some support in place to uh, help reduce that stress or engage in some self care um, or managing of that, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and the last thing I'll say here is that there was a really nice TED talk um, done a number of years ago by a health psychologist, Kelly McGonigal. And uh, Kelly talked a lot about our perception of stress being more problematic than having stress in and of itself. So if you're somebody that tends to have a more positive attitude and you look at stress as something that kind of helps fuel you forward in life, it helps you accomplish things, even if things are hard, you know, you're still able to, um, you know, do the things that you want to do in life, you know, that kind of mentality can be a lot more helpful versus if you feel the stress, and then you think, Oh, my goodness, what's happening to me, this stress is very bad, you know, or feels bad, um, that can have more of a negative impact. Um, and I did link to that TED talk at the end of my presentation in the resource list. Uh, so again, other things, financial concerns, you know, poor self-care, lack of support, all of these things can really contribute, you know, pre-existing medical or psychological challenges. You know, if you've had depression, for example, in the past, it's going to be harder to deal with uh, receiving a new diagnosis, having to face a new type of adversity. And I, I know we must have some caregivers on the call today, so I just wanted to quickly address some of the emotional challenges that care, our caregivers and our loved ones also face. So, you know, in addition to all the things I've talked about already, you know, caregivers tend to also experience kind of a unique um, set of stress and sometimes depression as well. So, um, you know, 40 to 70% of caregivers have been shown to have pretty significant depression. And so I think, you know, if you are a caregiver on this call, if you think, oh yeah, that's me. And if you haven't talked to someone about that before, uh, this could be a, a good reminder to do that. Um, you know, I always think of the um, analogy that I was told when I was first studying to be a social worker, which was that you have to to, on a plane, you have to put your own oxygen mask on before you can help other people. And that always really stuck with me. So if I'm not taking care of myself, then I can't help others. And similarly for caregivers. Um, some of the other things that come up can come up with caregivers are role reversals. So you if you're a caregiver, you know, perhaps an adult child, um, you might find yourself more in a parenting role for an older adult, uh, mom or dad who maybe needs more support than they used to. Um, also, if it's a spouse or loved one, maybe there are things that person used to be able to do that they can't do anymore. Okay, that's just a, a nice little word cloud I found online, but, um, you know, we're going to switch over and talk a little bit about wellness and emotional health. Um, when you're living with any kind of chronic health challenge, it's really important to pay attention to your emotional health. Um, and some of you might notice, you know, in the first part of this presentation, oh yeah, I think I might have a little anxiety or depression or noticing some grief and loss over just getting a diagnosis of glaucoma. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what do you do about that. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of different ways to manage your emotional well-being. And I think the thing to pay the most attention to is what helps you feel less stressed. You know, there are a lot of things in our culture, a lot of pressure, societal pressures, you know, advertisements, you know, social media, a lot of things that, you know, we're introduced to in our lives that may or may not actually be useful for you and your life and your situation. And so paying attention to what can help you feel less stressed and give you a sense of peace and ease can be really important. You know, just because your, your friend does yoga, that doesn't necessarily mean yoga is going to be the right thing for you. Um, the first thing on the list here are activities of daily living. So these are things like taking a shower and brushing your teeth and combing your hair and getting dressed every day and making a meal for yourself. So things that we typically think of, you know, for a lot of people that seem fairly easy to do or that we, you know, don't tend to have a lot of trouble with. 
And we don't think of them often as emotional well-being or self-care strategies. But if we're having a hard time, sometimes just getting out of bed in the morning can be what we need to feel better, um, you know, or making ourselves a meal that we really like or being able to, you know, make sure that we've taken a shower in the last couple of days, you know, that sort of thing. And so paying attention to how often you're doing those activities of daily living can really help you feel a sense of, okay, I'm participating in my life in a positive way. Um, and then all these other things, you know, exercise, healthy diet, you know, again, not everybody can run marathons. So figuring out what is a form of exercise that works for you and your body and your situation. Uh, similarly with healthy diet, there are a lot of fad diets out there that people easily latch on to because we're looking for quick fixes as, you know, as human beings, we want things to be easy. We want quick solutions, but that's not always how it works. And each diet doesn't work for each person. So working with your doctor to figure out what are the dietary changes that you need to make, uh, if any. And then some of the things in the other columns, so setting boundaries, you know, toxic people. So you might have people in your life that consistently cause stress for you. And so figuring out how do you set boundaries and reduce the amount of stress that comes into your life. And sometimes those are hard conversations to have, but I think setting boundaries can be really helpful. Um, and I added toxic positivity to this list. I think we see a lot of that in our culture, just this sense that we need to just put on a happy face and feel better about things. And I think that can be easy for some people, but when you're facing some kind of adversity, it's not so easy just to put on a happy face and pretend like everything's okay. And that really is what it becomes is this pretending. And so I think avoiding that toxic positivity, sometimes acknowledging when things are hard, being able to give yourself permission to feel those emotions that we've talked about, but then also figuring out, okay, how do I um, take care of myself today? Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to mention here. Um, I, yeah, I think that's good. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, so taking control, you know, I think sometimes being diagnosed with something such as glaucoma can feel like your control has been taken away. And so figuring out what are the things that we do have control over, I think, can be really helpful. And sometimes that's about managing our medical care. So sometimes, you know, it feels like, oh, okay, this is hard, so I'm going to want to avoid it. But I think that can leave us feeling less in control, actually, and can create a lot more anxiety. And so being able to see your doctor regularly, taking your medications as you're supposed to, you know, asking lots of questions, making lists before you go to the doctor's office with questions, or even bringing a loved one with you and making sure that they bring the list, having them ask the questions, uh, having that support system. And then also knowing when to say yes and knowing when to say no, you know, sometimes again, setting those boundaries can be really helpful, but then also sometimes giving ourselves permission to to have fun and to find joy in the world um, can be important too and can help us feel more in control in certain ways. Um, and then finding support. So there are a lot of ways that we can find support. Um, some of us do that through family. Some of us do it through friendships. Um, some of us do it by coming to you know health education events such as this one. And I know the Glaucoma Research Foundation puts on a lot of really fantastic webinars. Um, so making sure you're educated about what you're dealing with, I think can help you feel more in control and can also be a form of support and self-care. Um, if you notice, you know, those um, anxieties, depression, grief and loss, you know, if you notice that you're having a harder time or if you've dealt with adversity in the past and you don't know how you're going to do with this, um, you know, making sure you get some professional support on board too. Um, I listed kind of the options there. So LICSWs, that's what we call them in Washington State. I think in other states it might be LCSW. So, but clinical social workers make up the largest portion of private practice therapists that are out there. Um, so that might be something to look into. PhDs tend to be individuals who have psychology um, degrees, so psychology PhDs, um, but who also can do therapy. Also licensed marriage and family therapists, as well as licensed mental health counselors. Um, and then sometimes if talk therapy isn't enough, sometimes getting on an antidepressant for those who have more significant depression or anxiety um, or talking with a doctor about that can be really helpful. So a psychiatrist with an MD who has gone to school, um, to med school for many more years than some of um, us master's level therapists did. 
Um, and then support groups, which I'll talk about um, our support groups in a second. And then, you know, finally, if you ever have um, with depression, sometimes can come thoughts of suicide or thoughts of wanting to harm oneself. And so keeping these numbers on hand, there's even this crisis text line. If you don't feel comfortable making phone calls, uh, you can uh, text this number and, and get some support there as well. Okay, I think I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to breeze through this last part. Um, so as Michelle mentioned, I serve as the executive director for the Center for Chronic Illness, and we're a small nonprofit organization that was founded in 2016. And while we're based in Seattle, Washington, we actually serve patients from all over the country, as well as a handful of other countries. Um, that um, we have people from who attend our programs. And our goal is really to promote well being and decrease isolation. So we bring patients together in support group, um, currently all virtual support group environments uh, for support and education. And all of our programs are facilitated by licensed mental health professionals and are free of cost. Um, and I shared just a few of our flyers. We actually currently have 18 different uh, virtual support groups that meet monthly and ongoing. So our philosophy is really that things like chronic illness and um, glaucoma, they don't always go away. That's the nature of them being chronic. And so being able to offer this ongoing consistent support can be really helpful. Um, so as you can see, we have some just general living with chronic illness groups, we have some uh, programs focused on mindfulness. Um, we have some ones I didn't include that are focused focused on creativity and breath and movement. Uh, we have programs for caregivers, like our supporting loved ones group. We also have a parenting chronic illness support group. So for parents who have kids of any age that are dealing with health challenges. Um, for those who have glaucoma, a version of glaucoma that um, is a more rare version of glaucoma, you'd be welcome in our rare chronic illness support group. And then we do have a couple of um, BIPOC support groups. So one for supporting African Americans who live with chronic illness, as well as one which is our uh, first Spanish speaking support group. Uh, and this is my contact information. You're welcome to email me just at that general um, email above, um, or you can reach out to us anytime at the Center for Chronic Illness as well. Um, are you welcome to call us as well? We are a very small organization, so if you call us, our voicemail actually says, please email us if you can, but if you're not able to email, um, we will definitely call you back. So. Great, and here are just some resources of the things that I had talked about today, some of the studies. Um, that I came across on anxiety and depression and glaucoma, uh, things to check out. And I know there's always more being done. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. It's my turn. What an excellent talk and so appreciative of the work that you do, um, Allison Fine and in your group. And um, it's really incredible to um, have that support for us uh, as, as physicians uh, taking care of glaucoma patients and um, in the communication between the, the two groups. Uh, I practice in Portland, Maine, um, and this is our office in, in Portland. Next slide. I, I just have a few comments before we get to the other part of the program, but it's really about the, in, in my view of the emotional support um, and, and where it's, it starts is the doctor-patient relationship. And it's how we physicians and our staff, and our staff is very important in this, in this, uh, in this relationship and how we relate to, to you, the patient. Um, it's a two-way street. It's that you uh, trust the expertise that that we bring to the to the table to the exam room, and <clears throat> and that um, we rely on the trust that you give to us, and we both want the relationship to go well. And how our relationship goes, then we can explore a lot of the the issues of glaucoma and where to go with um, you know some of the anxieties and and some of the issues that come up with. Uh, that go beyond um, the regular medical part of this. So how do we make all this work? Next slide. So in the office, the reception, you come in and you fill out the paperwork uh, and, and then you meet technical staff and always wondering, you know, are they listening or just filling in information? 
and to have a conversation and to share your thoughts and concerns before you meet with the physician is helpful because then the team knows because it is a team that is taking care of you. Um, the testing is very anxiety pr provoking. Is the test okay? And I know that everyone in this call who's taken a visual field realizes that it's not an easy test. Even in a normal test, some 40% of the time, you won't see the spot. So it's, um, it's revealing when you, when you come into the, into the exam lane and we say, hey, the test was okay. And you say, well, I didn't see half of the clicks. So it's important to know that, that the visual field is an important test for us, but also a very challenging one. And we understand that, but it's, it is very important. And then, you know, is, is the medical opinion that the things are okay? I mean, are you, you know, getting the right information from us, whether things are stable or minimal or advanced? Do we have to act quickly? And to be open and discuss those issues with, with the physician is important. Um, and, you know, do you trust that the information is right? And if you're not really sure, it's, it's good to ask follow-up questions. The, the hopes, do you really understand that where this is leading? Now, glaucoma is not always a blinding illness. And if it's treated, it can be, um, even in, in advanced glaucoma, uh, vision can, can uh, be preserved for a long time. Or people with advanced glaucoma can have you know, severe visual field loss um, and still have 20-20 vision. And so there's a whole range of, of, of diagnoses and situations from, you know, you might have glaucoma to we better do something quick. And so to really know where this is leading and, and how severe it is, and that's a conversation uh, be with you and the physician and to be able to um, communicate. So the world of the office for the physician is a little bit different. We have multiple types of patients, multiple diagnoses, severe glaucoma, you know, mild glaucoma, uh, glaucoma suspects, um, and, and all of those issues have a different um, uh, quality to them. Um, there's also different issues with each patient in terms of not just the medical, but social issues like transportation, cognitive abilities, um, diversity, and in uh, social situation, we may be crossing paths. So we have to make sure that we can talk with each other and, and share the, the common experience. Um, so the you know, we rely on our technical staff to gather information and then we interpret testing. And when we relate to the patient, um, it's trusting that we can make the relationship work, that, the, um, that we can give a good technical assessment of the situation. Uh, and then we have to educate our fancy words and our uh, complex situations and understanding of the disease and the level of the disease um, has to be relayed. And so it's always trying to figure out how to best reach you, the patient, and, and how to um, discuss the impact on, uh, on your vision. And then really assess how that information is getting through and, and what else might be needed for that person. And that's where Allison finds work comes in, that's where the Glaucoma Research Foundation comes in and other support groups. Um, uh, there, in most states, there's a division for the blind. Uh, if you have severe problems, there's other support groups and, and other ways to uh, interact uh, beyond the physician's office, but we can help enter into that conversation. So it's really about teams. I see it as the, the support of the patient. It's physicians and their office teams working with you on a lot of the medical things and then helping uh, you and your family and friends 
uh, to understand what the disease is and how to interact um, uh, with this so that we can be a resource um, and, and that you can uh, feel um, like you're taking control of, of this problem and that you have a, a root and an understanding of, of what you need to do and what we all need to do to, to take care of you. Support groups are really wonderful. And then as Alison Fine was talking about was individual counseling and how that can be really powerful if one is having a hard time dealing with the situation. So I have um, not much more to say in a formal presentation, but uh, I can say that connecting with patients is three quarters of my job and trying to understand who they are, how I can relate to them. Um, sometimes it's talking about, you know, the, the sports game yesterday, you know, the, the, the Red Sox in my case. Um, but it's also connecting so that we have an understanding and a trust in each other. And that's really important. And, and it's important for patients to ask questions um, to, so that we get a better understanding of where some of the anxiety and fears are. And sometimes you don't know that you have the fear until later. And that is where we can sort of help you entree into these other support groups and teams that can be of help. So um, with that, I really thank the Glaucoma Research Foundation for putting this, uh, this uh, session together. It's really wonderful. And um, I will be referring many of my patients to Allison Fine's talk because it was excellent. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, both of you have done such a wonderful, wonderful job and given us such helpful information, um, not just for glaucoma patients, but for um, any patient at all. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, now we're gonna have our Q&A portion of the webinar and we're gonna be joined by Tracy and Patricia. Um, Pat was diagnosed with glaucoma 10 years ago. Um, but since her diagnosis, she's become an excellent artist, um, as you can see by the painting behind her, um, painting full time, entering juried shows and regularly selling her work. Um, Tracy was born with glaucoma, uh, congenital glaucoma, um, and he has spent nearly 20 years representing clients before Congress and federal agencies. Um, and he works with several different um, vision organizations, including Glaucoma Research Foundation. So thank you for everyone for submitting your questions. There have been many, many that are coming in and we're trying our best to answer as many as we can. As mentioned before, we're not gonna be um, talking about general glaucoma questions and, and glaucoma treatments, but we're gonna be talking about um, your emotional well-being. So to kick it off, um, I'd like to actually ask Tracy and Pat, when you were first diagnosed, well, actually, Tracy, I'm sorry, <laughs> you were just a baby, but maybe you can explain a little bit about um, your parents' experience. When you were first diagnosed, how did you feel and um, what helped you? How did you cope with it? What were your, your first steps? And um, maybe you can help explain all of that to some of the newly diagnosed um, patients that are listening in. Uh, I was first diagnosed 10 years ago and I went into a full-on panic mode. Um, I'll be honest, I was a very successful kitchen and bath designer and uh, loved my job, loved what I did, and just wasn't sure what the future held for me. So um, I still kept working for many years after that. Um, but when I started to have more vision loss, I had to take a step back and I realized um, that I really couldn't do what I had been doing for so many years anymore. Um, and that was, I, I had felt uh, actually a sense of grief, grief and a sense of loss. And for me to get past that, um, I did have to keep doing what I had always been doing, which I have always exercised. And I've always run with my dog and getting my dog out and getting out in nature and just trying to breathe and focus on one day at a time was really the best solution for me. Um, I didn't want to put too much effort or energy into what the future would hold because I really didn't know. Um, but I did become an advocate for my health 
Um, I did make sure that I um, found out everything I could about glaucoma and what procedures or, or what might be necessary for me to keep my vision. So I think becoming your own advocate is probably one of the best things you can do. And taking it one day at a time is another thing that I do every single day. Thank you, Pat, that's, that's mm -hmm. great. And Tracy, maybe you can explain also, um, not only if you know your parents' experience, but your experience when you became aware when you had glaucoma and what you felt at that point. Because I know there's several, um, there's several children that have glaucoma at a young age. And um, I was reading some of the comments um, that people have sent. And there's one, I believe it was a mother who's saying that her daughter um, has glaucoma as a teenager and, and or ch as a child, and now she's a teenager and is going through a, a roller coaster of emotions. And so it'd be good to hear what you went through and, and how you got through it. Sure. Um, well, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, I born with glaucoma, so I've literally had it my entire life. I've, you know, I've had to put in eye drops every day of my life. Uh, I turned 46 the other day, so 46 years of eye drops, hopefully 46 more, I guess. Um, you know, I, I think um, my, my parents did a good job in, in, you know, sort of making it be, treating me as normal as possible, of course, um, you know, making my medical regimen, and again, like with the eye drops and things like that, making it very routine, you know, first thing you do in the morning, put in drops before you go to bed, put them in, you know, that kind of thing. So it's not like an extra thing. It's just you brush your teeth, you put in your eye drops, you know, that, that kind of thing. And, and they made it very normal, um, which I think is helpful. And it's still how I consider it today. I, I don't consider <clears throat> putting eye drops in and, and, and the medications in, you know, an extra burden. It's just literally part of my day because it's always been part of my day and you don't consider it extra. Um, I, I think kind of what, what Pat said, you know, living day by day, I think, I think that's kind of important because if you start thinking about, oh no, off in the future, you know, I may not be able to see, or I may not be able to see as well, which, which may be true, uh, but it may not, as, as Dr. Solis said, you know, you can have, you can retain your vision for quite some time. Um, but, you know, focus on the here and now, you know, if there's something going on, you know, tomorrow or the, or the next weekend or the, or next month that you're looking forward to, you know, focus on that and, and, and do that, you know, and, and I kind of, um, you know, to that, I, sometimes when I think, oh, do I want to go, do I want to do something, you know, like there's something going on, you know, in the evening and like, do I want to do that or not? And I think hmm, I should, you know, if I'm kind of on the fence, it's like, I'm going to do it because I can, I'm able to, um, you know, some down, down the road, I may or may not be able to as easily. So I'm, I'm going to do it, you know, and it sort of it, it puts my thinking in there. Um, and, and then, you know, I think about things, you know, I, in one sense, because I've, I've, I've lived with glaucoma my entire life, I've had a, a long time to get used to it. Um, you know, so it's, it, it's not new to me. So I, at this point, I've, I've developed a sense of, you know, what I'm able to do, uh, what I'm not able to do. And when I was younger, that was, that was very difficult. You know, when, when you're a young person, um, you want to do everything that anybody else your age is doing, you know, and, and if you can't do it, it's, it's extraordinarily frustrating. Um, and, and so, but, you know, learn to focus on the things you can do. You know, I've played guitar for 30 years, you know, and, and that's something that I will be able to do forever, you know, um, and, and trying to find things like that, Pat said exercise, which I think is not only good for your health, otherwise they're not a doctor, but I, I, I've heard from ophthalmologists say, you know, regular exercise can also help with glaucoma in some ancillary ways as well. So I, I think nothing but good comes from exercising, you know, any way you can do that. I think that's helpful too. So, you know, it's, it's a lot, it can be challenging as a, as a kid, certainly because it's, it can be a very frustrating experience, but you know, it's likely there's more you can do than, than you cannot. So you focus on what you can do. Um, and then you, you learn every day. Thank you, Tracy. That's, that's very helpful and very insightful. So now I have a question. 
speaking a bit about, you know, learning about what you can do and what you can't do and, and what you can do with your friends or not. How should one share the information of your diagnosis with family and friends? Um, maybe Allison and Sam, do you have any, any tips on how people should share that information so they make sure that they have the support that they need? I'm, I'm happy to weigh in first. Um, yeah, so I think thinking about when you want to share, who are the most important people in your life and what what is the health of those relationships? You know, when you've shared difficult things with those individuals in the past, have they been able to hear those things and, and support you in the ways that you need support? So that's kind of something I always encourage people to think about is like, sometimes the people that we want to have support us are not always the people that do. And so I think if it's your first time sharing the diagnosis and you share with someone that doesn't have the capacity to give you what you need in that moment, that can feel really discouraging or minimizing or can, you know, prevent you from wanting to share with anyone else. And so I think being careful about who you share with first, and then maybe those individuals can be support people to you as you start to share with more people. Um, one of the questions that comes up in our support groups a lot is uh, for younger individuals that live with um, various chronic health conditions is, when do you tell your work, you know, your employer, when do you tell your, you know, if you're dating, when do you tell the people you're dating, that sort of thing. And, and it's really, there's not one right answer is what I would say to that. Um, and maybe Dr. Solish has some other ideas on that as well. But um, yeah, I think being careful about how you share it as well and being clear with yourself on what you're looking for and sharing, you know, are there specific tangibles that you can ask individuals for, you know, hey, I can't drive anymore. I need rides to doctor's appointments. Is that something that you can help me with? And, and being clear with yourself and honest with yourself about what you're looking for. I agree completely. The, um, the, the uh, people that you need to tell are, you know, close family members, but also arm, arm oneself with the knowledge of how serious this is because glaucoma to a lot of people means blindness and it's not and it's it's a chronic illness that sometimes leads to blindness but can be treated and sometimes is just very mild so it's really knowing your situation and and then um, talking to the folks who, who need to know some families don't like to talk about illness some people don't like to talk about the illness with friends um, and to, you know, target how you reveal that information. If it's about needing rides or not being able to drive at night um, or having trouble, you know, walking dark streets uh, at night, um, things like that may be, you know, may be difficult uh, to, to reveal, but it's important. I also agree that um, with Allison about uh, work situations and, you know, who needs to know when it comes to some of those kinds of things, because you don't want to be ostracized and, and all. Um, for, uh, I think one thing that's really happened that's been great in our society in the last few years is the recognition that we're not all perfect and not all kids are perfect. And that when there's an illness or a chronic problem, that you know it can be revealed and and kids sometimes you know right rightly so embrace um the 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 person with and their friend who has a, a problem or you know you've seen um children who rally around a kid who has leukemia or something like that so we're much more accepting of chronic illness and that's a good thing and we need to have more of it so that kids aren't bullied and, and, and that, that, um, you know, we have a better situation for, for them. And, and I think uh, we adults need to be more accepting too. That is very true. That is very, very true. Thank you. Um, we have a question now for Pat. Um, someone's asking what art do you find easiest to do? And if you have any tips for artists? <laughs> well, um, uh... Actually, I'm a painter and um, I used to do a lot of drawing all the time and I did a lot of very detailed drawing. And as uh, of course my vision wasn't as good as it used to be, um, I started to do more abstract work than doing more detailed work. 
And as far as art goes, I think it's very subjective to the individual. And I think that the most important thing is to find what makes you happy when you're in the process of creating that art. And I, like personally, I don't use any photographs, you know, as a reference when I paint. I just paint what's in my heart and what's inside of me. And I put all of that on the canvas you know, on the board, I use boards. But I think most importantly, get you on that canvas, make a part of you go with that canvas and how you're feeling. And I think that really does help to express a lot of the emotions that you know, we go through with glaucoma and just life in general. But I think it's most importantly to do what feels best for you. Um, I use everything. I use acrylic paint. I use, I put pencil on my board. I put oil pastel on my board. I do a mixed media type of thing. Sometimes I tear up paper and paste that on the board as well too. And I just think it's more important to stay true to yourself and just love what you're doing. Just enjoy it. That is fantastic. I, um, I should do it too. I used to draw and now I don't. So I should do it more often too. <laughs> um, it's very helpful. They even have, you know, those little um, mindfulness booklets that you can just kind of fill in with mandalas and those are beautiful. But anyways, um, I got sidetracked. And what should one do if you feel like you can't talk to your doctor or you feel like you're not on the same page? Um do they get a second opinion? What is your what is your take on that? Maybe Sam and I know Allison's nodding too. What what do you feel about that? It's about trust, and the trust has to be there. And if it's not, then it then you need to find other um, you know other practitioners or other ways. Um, and sometimes trust can be gained and earned between physician and patient with some hard work. Um, and, you know, sometimes I've had patients who just didn't, you know, get what I was saying or didn't feel like I was being um, sensitive enough. And we talked about it and we came to a new understanding um, of where we were and, and it really became a stronger relationship. So I, I'm an advocate for, you know, speaking up, but also knowing that you have other choices. Yeah, absolutely. My my gut reaction to that question is find a new doctor. But uh, upon reflecting, as Dr. Solish was talking a little more, you know, I think another important thing to think about is what do you look for in a relationship with the medical provider? You know, some of us really want somebody who has great bedside manner. Like for me, that's really important to me that I feel like somebody is it can listen and sees me and hears me but then i also want someone who has medical expertise you know i want to be able to know that i can trust what they're saying they believe in science you know they're they're knowledgeable about what i'm dealing with and so i think thinking before you're looking for medical providers what is it that you're hoping to get out of those relationships and if something isn't working is it because the doctor gave you bad news and it was hard to hear or is it because they don't listen to you in the appointments is it because they're not, you know, recommending the, you know, known treatment for something, you know, and so figuring out what is it, what is it that you need that's different? And yeah, absolutely. Second opinions, I think can be really valuable. And if it's, you know, not everybody meshes together. And so if it really just isn't working, find, find a new doctor. Great advice. Yeah. Um, sometimes I even say a third opinion might be necessary to tie it off. <laughs> um, anyways, um, another question that came in are what are some strategies that one can implement to deal with the anxiety before a doctor's visit, especially if you're newly diagnosed and you're trying to figure out what the next treatment is or what the best treatment is for you? Um, what are those strategies? And I know uh, maybe Tracy or Pat can also share what they do before um, going to, to the doctor's appointment, if there's anything that you find helpful. Just this week had uh, my doctor's appointment for the first time in seven months, and I was uh, very anxious, and I was already telling myself what the outcome would be before I even walked in the door. And um, I have started really to just stop and make myself stop that thinking pattern. And when I get in the door, 
I just try to breathe. I just try to focus on the time that I'm there. Um, I go through the visual field. I have to do you know all of that every single time I go. But um, actually, I started meditating in the doctor's office, and I do breathing exercises in the doctor's office. And um, sometimes I take out my iPhone and I'll do a word puzzle or something, anything to get my mind off of telling myself what the outcome is going to be, because I don't know what it is, you know, and I just have to leave it in the hands of the doctors that they're going to make the right diagnosis. And I just have to let go. So I think for me, the main thing is pulling back and stopping the negative thinking and focus more on just trying to relax and uh, take it as it comes. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, taking some deep breaths either right before you walk into the office or, you know, most of the time once you check in, you'll, you'll sit down in a waiting area for, you know, a, a few minutes and just sit there and just relax, you know, for, for a couple of minutes, whether you, whether you meditate just or take some deep breaths, that kind of thing. Um, because I, I used to get, particularly when I was in junior high and high school, very, very anxious. Um, to, in, you know, before seeing a doctor. Um, and then I think Pat said something else, you know, have, have some distractions, you know, um, whether it's, you know, you can just listen to a, a podcast in one ear, you mm -hmm. know, why, why you're waiting there. Or, um, you know, if, if you are able to read, you know, and bring a magazine or, or, you know, read on your phone or that kind of thing, just, to, you know, go in knowing if you have particular questions you want answered or things you want to talk about, have those ready but other than that you know have a distraction so that you're just not sitting there you know mm -hmm. thinking about what what may or may not what you may or may not hear can i chime in with one point which yeah. is when and this is a medical point which is when you're getting your eye pressure checked it's important not to hold your breath or to take big deep breaths it's important to just uh, try and you know breathe normally and be try and be as relaxed as possible because um, those are things that can change the eye pressure reading at the time. So it's important to, to you know, be relaxed and take some deep breaths in anticipation of the visit, uh, of course, and, and to try and relax. Uh, I'll toss in one final thought here. I think oftentimes with anxiety, our brains create worst case scenarios. And so Sometimes, you know, if we have a diagnosis of glaucoma, for example, we don't want that worst case scenario to happen. And maybe the worst case scenario is what if I end up blind, right? Um, I'm guessing that's maybe for a lot of you, the worst case scenario. I think sometimes it, not embracing that idea, but allowing yourself to say, okay, well, what if, you know, what if I, the doctor says, hey, you're going to be blind by, by this age or by this time or something like that. I think that allows opportunity for figuring out then what's next, you know, because sometimes with anxiety, we just live in that like, oh my gosh, this bad thing's going to happen. And then, and then we don't let ourselves get past that. And we just get stuck on the bad thing is happening. And so, you know, if, if that doesn't create too much more anxiety, allowing yourself just to say, okay, well, if this happens, then this, or if this happens, then this, and, and allowing yourself to have some strategies for after the bad news, I think uh, it can help you feel more in control. One, one thing that I do with patients, um, and I think this is helpful, is that especially with patients who are new, newly diagnosed and they have you know, maybe very early glaucoma. And so I say, if this is normal and this is blindness, you're here or here. And so to say blindness is pretty far away and we're gonna try and keep it as far away as possible and we're gonna to work together to make that happen. And when they see that graphically with my hands, I can just watch their anxiety you know, melt away. So it, it's, it's a little trick that I've, that I've used for many years. And um, it's really nice to be able to relieve someone of that pent up anxiety about the visit. We do have one last question that maybe Pat and Tracy can, can answer from different perspectives. How do you not let glaucoma affect your career choice or your career path? Any advice on that? I, I will admit, you know, that, that, that is a tough question uh, because I, I continue to kind of um, 
give that a lot of thought. Uh, I, you know, I, I've been able, as, as, as you mentioned in your introduction, Michelle, you know, I've been working in Washington, D.C. for a little over 20 years now, um, and I'd like to do 20 more. There's some aspects of my job that I w- could be able to do regardless of my vision. Um, others could be a little more difficult. And, and so I, I, I have started to think about, um, you know, if, if my vision were, were to get worse, um, you know, where are my strengths at, you know, what, what would I still be able, what, what could I still do? Um, what might become more difficult and, you know, thinking about jobs, particularly I do government relations work, you know, what kind of jobs would, would, would be best if my vision were, were, were to get worse, say over the next decade or two decades, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I do give some thought to that. Um, you know, I, I'm up front with my employers about my capabilities um, and, and, you know, the, the limitations that I do have. And I've never had an issue uh, with any of my employers, you know, saying, oh, well, that's going to be a problem. You know, they've never, they've never said that, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I, I wish I had a very short, succinct, peppy answer for it. Um, I, but it, it is something that I continue to think about. And, and as I get a bit older, I do think more about um, again, you know, where are my strengths at and, and what am I confident that I could be able to do very, very well, regardless of my level of vision and, and try to steer my work and, and my career in that direction so that, you know, regardless of what happens, I'll be able to do, to do something that I like and, and be productive at it as well. Well, and I agree. That's a very difficult question. And um, ironically, I had to change career paths um, with the onset of glaucoma and vision loss. And um, the funny part about it was that I wanted to be an artist my whole life, <laughs> but I had to take a career path that I could make a living and I ended up falling in love with it and then had to walk away. So I was very fortunate that I had a backup plan and I don't know and I often think to myself, if I didn't have glaucoma, the life I have now, I never would have followed. So sometimes there is a silver lining in this because now I'm doing what I always wanted to do. But I do think that knowing yourself and you know, looking ahead is a good thing, but life sometimes hands you solutions that you had no idea were going to be there. And I think that's what happened to me. So I do consider myself very fortunate in many ways. Wow. I cannot thank you all enough for everything you've mentioned today. I have found it enlightening and very helpful. And I'm sure everyone else has found it as well. Um, all the advice you've given, just not for just glaucoma patients, but for everyone in general. And it's been amazing. Thank you so much. I'd also want to thank all of our participants for your interest and your support today. And if we were unable to answer your question, we'll try to do it on one of our upcoming webinars, or maybe we've answered it in one of our recent ones. Um, which you can find on our website, www.glaucoma.org. And we've also shared many videos on our social media platforms. But remember, we are always here for you and we always wanna help in any way that we can. So reach out to us if there's anything we can do for you. Um, And one last thing that I'd like to uh, like to share with you is that um, there's a unique glaucoma community app now. It was launched by Prevent Blindness for glaucoma patients and caregivers. Um, They have a My Care section where you can put input all of your information. Um, There's different articles and you can follow topics that are relevant for you. Um, And you can also chat with other members. So that is fantastic for you that are looking for support groups and finding trying to find other ways of support. Um, This is a great way to communicate with other people that have um, glaucoma or have loved ones with glaucoma. So all you need to do is search for the glaucoma community app in in your phone or your tablet and um, you can download it for free. Once again, I'd like to thank Aerie Pharmaceuticals for their sponsorship and 
again, thank you for all of your attention today and for your interest in Glaucoma Research Foundation. Because of you, the cure is truly insight. Thank you everyone and see you next time.